Paul Smith, Executive Director of Community Development in the Department of Planning and Community Development. And I'm really pleased that so many of you are here. Can't hear you. Can't hear? Sit closer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will encourage you to get up after I finish speaking and just come a bit closer. It'll be easier for Marcus to have a conversation with you, I think, um, if you wouldn't mind doing that. But I'm really pleased to be able to welcome Marcus Westbury. Um, who established Renew Newcastle a little while ago now. He'll tell you a bit about its origins. And he's also recently um, established Renew Australia and watched this space for Renew the World, um, which I'm sure is uh, coming sometime soon. Um, I had the privilege of speaking, uh, listening to Marcus recently at a forum that uh, was organised by um, uh, uh, local government and arts uh, practitioners who were interested in thinking about the intersection of those disciplines and how it is that we can make better um, cultural use and creative use of, of spaces that local government is bedeviled um, by uh, from time to time when vacancies occur in, in places in prominent locations and how we can uh, kind of do better uh, with those um, resources available to, to local government. Uh, Marcus is a, um, a product, um, I'm delighted to say, of uh, the social traders um, program that we fund in Victoria, which is a, a, um, responsible for, amongst other things, from amongst other things, of incubating business ideas that have a social purpose. And so we're really delighted that um, this uh, particular process has been supported in that way and has been able to uh, make a unique contribution to the fortunes of Newcastle and increasingly other places around the country and indeed um, other locations overseas as well. Marcus is a broadcaster and a writer and a media maker and a festival director. He's been responsible for um, some of Australia's most unconventional and creative um, approaches to thinking about um, uh, 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 cultural space, cultural transactions and temporary cultural kind of, um, businesses occurring in a variety of settings in, in unloved parts of um, central business districts around, around the country. He's going to talk to you about that today. Um, why we were so pleased and interested to hear about Marcus's work is because in the community development area we are constantly working with local government around plans for renewal and revitalisation of urban spaces and to think about the community building potential and capacity of cultural practice and ways to strengthen um, communities' sense of identity and, uh, and to encourage uh, local economic development as well through the arts and cultural practice. So I know that you'll find the story of Renew Newcastle really stimulating and interesting and what I hope that it will do is encourage you to think about your own practice and your own work and what the opportunities might be in Victoria for us to be embracing some of these principles um, as circumstances um, uh, uh, um, are, are created for us to do that. And um, so I'm really delighted to be able to uh, welcome Marcus who's going to give us, a, I think, um, a shortish presentation on the history of into our, our Renew Newcastle and open it up to some discussion for us to be asking questions but also um, positing our own kind of issues and, and responses to this work as well. So thank you very much, Marcus. Please, um, please welcome him. So today I'm just going to talk about uh, Renew Newcastle as a bit of a case study. Um, and explain some of the key ideas behind this project and then hopefully lead into a discussion about how we might apply some of these ideas here in Victoria. I should begin by saying I live in Melbourne, so I've, I grew up in Newcastle. Newcastle is my hometown and I have been, but I have been living in Melbourne for the last eight years. I moved here in 2002 to take on a job directing the Next Wave Festival and I've been here ever since and I'm very much based in Victoria these days, as is Renew Australia. But this story starts in Newcastle and, and Newcastle is my hometown and I guess I have long been obsessed with the problems of my hometown and, and that's probably, I'll, I'll just work out where I can stand and see all this. Um, so I don't know how much, who, who's been to Newcastle recently? I don't know. Um, so Newcastle, as everyone probably knows, is uh, famous for having had a steelworks once that, that sort of ended like this. Um, this, uh, in, in the beginning of the 1980s, the BHP Steelworks in Newcastle employed about 20,000 people. And then by the time they closed it, uh, it was down to a few thousand people. And then in the late 90s, it, it closed down entirely. And that was one of many factors, I think, that have over the years contributed to the decline of Newcastle's CBD. Um, here's just um, some footage of the various um, uh, film and doco makers took of Newcastle in recent years. I don't know, has, have people been there and sort of seen the state of the main street so this is kind of, this, here's some examples of state of buildings. I always say I, I really, really love Newcastle, but I don't actually work for the tourism people. And you can sort of tell by the fact that I show clips like this. Um, 
the, at street level, I, I went back to Newcastle in, in sort of early 2008, and this really where Renew Newcastle has its beginnings. I'd been away and gone back a lot, and I think what happens is when an area is in decline, if you live there, it almost happens, it's almost, you know, it's like a frog in boarding water. It happens like by drip, by drip, by drip. You don't really notice it. But when I go away and come back, it was like seeing it in time lapse. You know, you, rather than there just being one shop that had closed down, half a block had disappeared in the six months since I'd been there last. And you'd sort of, um, and so I was really profoundly aware of, of, of the extent to which um, the city was in decline. I took all these photos uh, in the lead up to when we started Renew Newcastle. So this is mid 2008. This is an example. This is the second oldest theatre in Australia. This has been empty all my life. Um, I'm 30, well, there's, there, was a, there was a toy shop and a few other stores in the foyer basically, but the actual theatre bit up the back has been empty. I'm 37. I don't remember when this space was actually open and active. Um, this is Newcastle's post office. It's been a really contentious site in the city. It was sold off by the federal government about 10 years ago. The state government in New South Wales recently bought it back and are in the process of, of trying to do something with it. I don't think they've entirely resolved it, but at the time when we started this, you can see it's fenced off, it's tagged, the, the windows, are, you can't really see it, but they're boarded up in the upstairs. Stairs. So you can imagine the psychology of this on the community is pretty, pretty negative. I always think if you want to make a post-apocalyptic zombie movie, Newcastle would be an excellent place <laughs> to film it. This is a, a fish and chip shop that closed down, I don't know, five, ten years ago. I like how the, I really like how the fish cake and chico roll signs are sort of still up. Uh, there's, you know, the booths are still there, the chewing gum stand's still up, but no one's been there for, for five years or more. And then you get examples like this. This is a building that has been um, literally gutted, like it's been squatted and set on fire and falling into the street. And um, this is not the only, it's probably the worst example, but certainly not the only site like that in the, in the CBD of Newcastle. And, and what was happening as a result of this is that um, the, the, you get a sort of self-perpetuating feedback loop. As, as activity leaves, then people find it harder to stay. No one, you know, if, if, if you're on a half empty block, you're very reluctant to stay there and no one wants to be the first one to open up on an empty street. So you get these feedback loops that come into play which lead to things like this. This is a new building that's been built and the upper floors have been tenanted to commercial tenants but the ground floor is still um, empty because no one wanted to open up on that in that site. That's directly across the road from that gutted block I was showing you a minute ago. You have to be pretty brave to, to take a five year lease and think about um, starting a business there or, or moving a business there. Um, all up, I counted them, I mapped them, I wrote them in a little notebook and then I came back later and mapped them all up. There was about 150 empty buildings in the two main streets of Newcastle. And in a lot of ways, I think Newcastle's got a mega version of what's happened in lots of um, suburban centres, regional centres and main streets around the country where basically someone built a shopping centre and it killed the main street. In Newcastle's case, um, there's about five shopping centres and the main street is like two and a half k's long. The reason Newcastle had this, long, this main street was because of the tram era. Once upon a time, trams used to funnel everyone in to shop in what was the CBD. And f for various geographical factors, the, the centre of the city isn't really in the centre. People live out here. You know, they don't tend to live in that little corner there. So the CBD is a bit of a misnomer in that context. The, the logic of the long, thin main street made sense when everyone kind of came in by tram. Nowadays, they've all got cars and they go out and shop in suburban shopping centres, which, as you can see, are all out here. So for the, the old centre of town to be the retail centre it once was, almost everyone who lives in the greater Newcastle area has to drive past one or other of these suburban shopping centres to get into the centre of town. So the logic for why all those commercial buildings were there and the way it was are largely gone. And Newcastle's also unique in being the largest or one of the largest cities in Australia that's not a centre of government. So there's none of the, the business of government which tends to hold a CBD together and all the associated um, uh, spin-offs and hangers-ons and government departments and things that go with that. So I, I'd looked at this problem for a long time. Now my, my background is working in arts and cultural projects, festivals and events. I've worked a lot with um, particularly young, but generally artists that are very motivated, keen to make things happen. I, I, one of the assumptions I didn't start with in Newcastle, which I think has probably confused a lot of people for a long time, was the idea that the reason these buildings were empty was because no one wanted to do anything in them. In my experience, lots of people wanted to do things in them, but there wasn't practical processes that connected up the spaces with the people who wanted to do things. So my first basic principle for Renew Newcastle is very simple. Empty spaces are lost opportunities. Every day that one of those spaces sits empty is a lost opportunity for someone to try something. Um, and a larger idea which sort of follows on from that is that initiative and experiment 
transportation and not just capital are keys to revitalisation. So there's been a lot of debates in Newcastle about what should be built, uh, what development should take place, what the physical hard infrastructure of the city should be changed to being in order to promote revitalisation. But in my mind, one of the most effective strategies to re revitalise any area is to simply encourage a lot of people to try a lot of things and see what happens. And Renew Newcastle is really about embracing that idea. In order to kind of make that play out in practice though, we needed to create something to release what I thought was the potential in that community. And that led to the creation of Renew Newcastle. Um, legally, formally, Renew Newcastle is a not-for-profit company. We are established in December 2008 and we have a board made up of various stakeholders in the local community. We have people from the arts community, people from the business community, CEO of the local business chamber, people who work for the um, Main, Street, Main Street Committee. Um, we have you know, accountants, lawyers, various professional people. One of, the, one of the key things about Renew Newcastle is that it isn't an advocacy group for property owners, it isn't a group for artists lobbying to property owners. It's, it's very much as an entity, it's positioned in the middle of a range of different interests and making sure that they are all represented and connected around the table. Um, more simply, Renew Newcastle, this is the way I can best describe it, Renew Newcastle is a permanent structure for temporary things. So we are designed to be an entity that has an ongoing, enduring life, but our aim is to promote as many short-term, ongoing, temporary initiatives that we can possibly make happen in spaces while they are empty. We're not a government scheme, so we are now funded by the New South Wales government and the local council in New South Wales, but initially the seed funding for Renew Newcastle came from my credit card. And one of the real obsessions with this project is around efficiency. How do you, because we had almost no resources, what is the cheapest, most efficient, most effective way of making the largest number of potentially good things happen? And that's been really, really, really critical to our thinking. Um, one of the things that is critical though is that we needed to engage property owners and convince them to get behind the scheme that we were putting in place. Uh, to, to explain where we come from, Renew Newcastle, I sometimes talk about cities as software and hardware. Renew Newcastle isn't about the hardware. We haven't changed anything. We haven't changed the paving, the street signage, the, the interpretive murals, the um, anything about the hardware of the city. We've changed the rules, we've changed the processes, we've changed the ways in which people can do things and the prerequisites you need to negotiate if you want to make something happen. We've done that largely by developing a unique legal model. So we as Renew Newcastle, or I sometimes describe it, we are an organisation into which others can invest their risk. People who don't want to take risks, people that are risk averse, property owners, people with ideas for projects. We manage some of their risks. We manage the insurance, we manage the legal complexities, we manage negotiating, we manage getting people in and out of properties when property owners might not be able to do that. Our core model revolves around a 30 day license agreement. So we borrow buildings while they're empty on a rolling 30 day basis from their owners and when the owner gets a better offer they can take the building back. Um, we're all about incubation rather than permanence. We're all about trying to give lots of things an opportunity to start rather than trying to worry too much about the fixed outcomes that we're trying to produce one, two, three, four, five years down the track. We find creative projects. We put them into spaces on a low or no rent basis with an obligation to take care of spaces and ensure that they are used and activated until their future is resolved. That gives the people who've got passionate ideas a chance to incubate their ideas and it gives the owner a custodian in the building and, and allows for uh, lots of things to start. I, I had to invent a whole new word to describe the sort of people that we're looking for. And this word is actually so clunky that I have actually misspelt it on previous versions of this presentation. So um, the word is initiativist. I'm really interested in people who are initiativists, people who want to find out whether something is um, possible by doing it. Um, the people that I'm really trying to work with are people who are passionate about their ideas, they want to get in, they want to do it and they want to see what happens. They're the person who would rather run the experiment than write the plan and in many respects they're the opposite of a bureaucrat. So they actually, they would rather take the risk and find out what happens than work out how to make the risk disappear. And I think some embracing of that approach is actually a larger argument that I've got around um, cultural policy and, and in general about how we go about supporting creative things. We find initiativists, we lower their barriers to entry, we foster their experiments, and we change the dynamics in the city through their activity. So we wanted to run an experiment. Uh, Renew Newcastle, I'd been talking a lot about these ideas for a long time, but I wanted to run an experiment in practice. And we were able to do that in this part of Newcastle. So this is the main Hunter Street Mall in Newcastle. I don't know if anyone, does anyone know it or 
been to it. Not a lot, one hand. Um, so this was, I mean, in the, you know, I guess in the early 80s or 90s, this was the area where uh, my grandmother would dress up to go out shopping. You know, like it was the place where it was the centre of town back in the day. But it's been falling on hard times for a long period. All of these red dots were empty buildings when we began working in the mall. Um, we were fortunate in that this site had been largely consolidated. So the GPT group owned a lot of their buildings around this site and they were able and they were willing to get on board and support us uh, in activating their spaces and making their spaces available to us. This is the mall in 2008. You can sort of see it's empty, 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 empty. You get, that is a peak lunchtime crowd in the Hunter Street Mall in Newcastle in spring 2008. I always, people always think I cheated when I show these slides because I, I always have to point out there are signs, right? They're, they're like buildings are open. At least the things that are actually there are open. I didn't come in on a Sunday when everything was closed or a public holiday. That was literally kind of what it looked like at the time. And that was the same area in summer 2009 after Renew Newcastle had been operating in that area for about a year. Now I've got, there's a lot of really, really, really great reviews of Renew Newcastle, but these are my favourites. Uh, these are from the Newcastle Herald's website when the Newcastle Herald published photos of a crowd in the mall. And um, people literally didn't believe it. And I, think, I, I don't think you can get a better review for the sense of what you've achieved than someone declaring that you've faked it. And, um, um, so, and incidentally, this, this, was, this was accusing the Newcastle Herald, not us, of faking it. So it was the paper that was being accused in this context, not, not us. Um, and this is basically how we did it. We negotiated access to those buildings that were empty around the mall. There were about 20 of them at the time. And we made them available to initiativists. We made them available to people who were passionate about their ideas, who wanted to get in and clean up and fix up and activate those spaces. So um, that's a bit of a work in progress, setting one up. This is an example. This is a collective of local... Um, I'm going to stand over this side, actually, so I can see this a bit better. Um, this is a collective of local mums who all make... Uh, uh, clothes, bags, jewellery, most of the things you can sort of see here, uh, artworks, etc., are their own work. Uh, this is a photography gallery. There's a it's a really interesting example because Newcastle had never had a dedicated photography gallery before. It turned out when one was created, there's a huge community of photographers in Newcastle who were looking for an outlet. And the guys that created this gallery were essentially sort of pro-am photographers themselves and they put on exhibitions for local photographers. Um, at one point they had about a two-year waiting list for photographers wanting to exhibit in this space and one of their shows, which was a group show of works by local photographers, I think had 800 people come to the opening because there were that many people that were connected to the, the community and the things that were taking place. Um, this is an Indigenous visual arts gallery supporting the work of local Indigenous artists. Uh, this guy's a landscape photographer. These ladies make hats. Um, this is a zine store, so sort of, I don't know if people know what a zine is, but it's sort of photocopied, handmade publication. Uh, this guy's a jeweller. Um, this is another home for local craftspeople, artisans, and fashion designers. Uh, you can tell by the sort of, what's that about? Look, that's um, a contemporary art space. <laughs> um, and it's interesting, this is a gallery and studio complex. So there's a gallery on, this is on the upper floors of one of the buildings. So there's a gallery there and then there's about five studios that are clustered around it. Um, this is a co-working space for uh, graphic, desi graphic designers, publishers, people working from their laptops at home, basically, who wanted to get out of the house and work from a more professional space. And this is a really interesting example, actually. It's an example of working within the limitations of space. So we borrow buildings from the owners on whatever terms the owners are willing to make them available on. And some of them they're going to knock down and they don't really care. This, in this case, this was like grade A office space. It had just been um, renovated by the people. And they were, like, they were of the view that we couldn't do anything. You couldn't put a pin in the wall. You couldn't... Um, you know, you couldn't paint anything, you couldn't bring anything, you basically had to take the space as is. And this entire fit out was done around those constraints and it was very successful. And they've actually had to move a couple of times, but they've moved from grade A office space to grade A office space just by pulling their desks and laptops and whatever to wherever they need to go. This is a tea house gallery, that's a hub for local artisans and craftspeople. This is our office, which is, is an old church. I always, people, when I say old church, I always think some beautiful standstone building. Um, it's brown and brick and built in the 70s, but, you know, we love it. Um, this is one of my favourite stories. So the, the woman who did this was a surf photographer. She was 19 years old. She came to us and said, I'm, um, she was unemployed. I, I, uh, I have 
I'm a surf photographer. I've been a surf photographer all my life at 19. Um, I, she had some success. She'd basically, you know, she'd quit school and been running around taking photos of surfing and surf stuff for years. She'd had the odd thing published in a surf magazine and whatever, she, but not, not anywhere near making a living out of it. She said, my dream is to open a surf photography gallery and Newcastle's on the beach and it seemed like a good fit and whatever. But at the age of 19, I would struggle to think what other kinds of programs would have taken a risk on someone like that. Um, her, she had no formal training, business skills, or identifiable business skills, whatever. She had about uh, seven or eight months in a new Newcastle space, um, and then a commercial tenant moved into this space. She'd had long enough to realise that she had a viable business, and she's now been paying rent for nearly two years, a block up the road, as a viable, successful commercial business incubated out of Renew Newcastle. Um, this is just a, this is another example. This is a bare concrete shell. This building had never been fitted out, and the um, owners uh, had never invested anything in it because the upper floors had been renovated, but the lower floor no one was interested in. We made this available to uh, contemporary artists who set it up as a contemporary art space. And they did a series of exhibitions and they're working very much with the constraints of the building. There was just a couple of PowerPoints in each room, no lighting, anything. They managed to make that work. Sure enough, as soon as the buildings were activated and showed that they could be used and there was a pattern of people out the front, commercial tenants took interest in this. Now this building was um, in that state for lease when I left Newcastle in 2002. So it had been seven or eight years no one had considered renting this building and the, the catalyst of activity led to it being leased. This is a sound art gallery. The only dedicated sound art gallery in all of Australia was on the Hunter Street Mall in Newcastle for about um, a couple of years. It's, it's since moved on, but uh, this is actually also one of my favourite stories. I was out the front. I, I should backtrack. I, I've done lots of festivals and events that are full of the sort of work that old people complain about. And I was standing out the front of this um, shop one day and this woman comes up to me who was probably in her, I guess, late 70s or 80s and taps me on the shoulder and said, look, are you, are you the guy responsible for this? This. And, you know, it's a sound art gallery, right? So it's not... Some of our stuff is, has very wide appeal, this one not so much. And I said, mm, you know, uh, so, sort of. I've had a bit to do with it. And she said, um, this... It, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, because this had been a, a clothes shop, a men's clothing store. Her husband had bought the suit, her late husband had bought the suit for the, her, their wedding there. And she said, every day I walk past here, it's, it breaks my heart. And it's so nice just to see people in here and active and using this space again. And she turned out she'd also been a parishioner at the church, which had closed down five years before or something like that, which we were using as our office. And she said, oh, I hear you using the church. Can I come in and have a look? And I, again, I thought, less consecrated than it used to be. You know, I wasn't sure how she'd react. But she came around and she brought a clipping from the paper about the day the church closed down, which she'd saved and kept all of these years. And again, said, I'm just so pleased to see that people are in here and using this space. It's broken my heart to see it not being used. Um, and I, I, that's one of my favourite examples, I think, of the value. It's not just about buildings and places, but it's about people's stories and connections and pride of place that are part of this as well. Here's the bigger picture from an economic point of view. Um, all of these red dots were empty buildings when Renew Newcastle started operating in that area. The green trees are new uh, Renew Newcastle projects. I always I need, keep meaning to redo this with better symbols. I've got clip art trees and use them. The green trees are um, new, Renew Newcastle projects. The little yellow flags that are starting to appear, they're new commercial tenants that moved into the area as the foot traffic came back and the life came back. You can see over time, the transformation is really dramatic. This area had been in a state of decline for decades, like just going backwards. There had been no forward progress. Things had been moving out, not in. We, our presence and the activity and the interest and the people, the passion that brought people back, brought economic activity back to the centre as well. That's the before and that's the after. The difference is just are, are staggering and you can see it in that area. I think, the, the, again, one of the most interesting signs of success is that people have forgotten how bad it was before. People, you know, people have actually forgotten that that mall used to be empty. Um, and here's some just examples before and after on the ground of specific places. So this is a shop, um, you can see it was partially boarded up, the windows had been kicked in and the owner was sick of repairing it. Um, we put these guys, these guys were making a record, running a record label from their bedroom, basically making 
um, unlistenable noise music and exporting it all around the world. Um, we gave them this shop. They didn't, it's a classic example of the sort of place that doesn't necessarily need a shop. It's not exactly a retail business, but what they were doing was creative. It had a community of interest around it. And this site in particular was standing on its own in a block in a part of town where we didn't have any other shops nearby. And we deliberately chose these guys because they're quite robust guys and their community that's interested in what they're doing aren't going to be daunted by the fact that all the other shops along here are boarded up. These guys moved in, they activated it. They were in there for about two years. As they came in there, the buildings around them started opening up again. Um, a couple of other compatible businesses moved in and now there's a commercial tenant um, in this space. Uh, but they got an opportunity to take their, their record label and their business to a new level through the space that we made available. Here's another example. This shop had been empty for about as long as I can remember. It occasionally would have like a $2 shop like, or a rug sale or a closing down, going out of business sale. I always think that that's the worst form of activity you could possibly get in any area. There's no kind of, there is no sign of like this area is on the brink of death. Then quite like, you know, we're having a going out of business rug sale liquidation here. Um, occasionally one of those, it now looks like that. Or it did look like that. They've actually moved to another shop. But, um, this is one of my favourite examples because the people who took this space did the fit out on uh, $60 and hard rubbish day. And if you look really carefully, all of the bits of furniture and stuff are things they found by the side of the road. The, the actual colourful life stuff is the things they make themselves. And my favourite thing is that the, the shade of white is a unique white shade because they couldn't afford tins of paint. So they went around to all of their friends and got the ends of all the white paint tins that they had in their garages, mixed them up in a giant bucket and came in and painted those walls. Uh, and I actually think that's the best, that, that still is, they moved to another shop now, but it's the best looking shop on that street. It's a $60 fit out. Um, this is another example. This one was a bit more spent on it, but this was an ophthalmologist surgery used by eye doctors and um, it had been empty for quite some time. Now it looks like that. We made this, um, there's like five or six different consulting rooms that we made available to kind of small professional businesses. So mostly graphic designers, publishers, you know, people who were working from home, sunrooms, spare rooms on their computers. Um, they've, a lot of them have been really successful businesses. So it's not, not so successful on the street activation side of things because it's an office that's hidden away. But most of these businesses have gone from being one person or part-time businesses to employing several people since they've been there. And one of them's an interior designer and another one of them's a photographer, which possibly explains just why those photos are as good as they are. But uh, nonetheless, it's, I just think it's a really amazing example, again, of just applying people's passion to a space that had been discarded and wasted and then growing economic life as well as cultural activity out of it. Over in Newcastle, we've been sort of expanding further afield. So we've started, we started in this very concentrated area, which we've largely filled up. It tends to be nowadays that the street fronts on the mall are mostly commercially tenanted. Um, we've tended to, we've still got properties that are around the back, upstairs in that general precinct, but we've lost the street frontage. Um, and then these, these little projects, we've started to plant these one-off projects in other parts of town and we're gradually expanding out of that. Um, it's been really, really successful. We've launched more than 70 new projects and enterprises in Newcastle since we began in, the first one got their keys in February 2009. None of them, none of the projects got funding. So there's no, no grant funding has gone into any of the projects. All they got was the space and a process that supported them to do what they wanted to do. One of the key drivers of this thing is about a process that supports people in their ideas, not ask them to conform to ours, which has been really important. Um, here's just an example of the project at two different stages. So this is a, well, we, we produce these maps. They go in the windows of all of the shops so you can find all the other ones. This is an early version. I'll just give you an idea of the range. This is a, um, uh, the record label uh, space. This is a contemporary art space. It's an upcycled design space, an indigenous art gallery place that does sort of children's arts classes and things like that, a hub for local fashion designers, uh, a surf photographer, uh, the shop I showed you before with the $60 fit out, uh, artist run gallery and studio complex, sound art gallery and animation studio, uh, craft, uh, jewellery, clothes, retailer, uh, tea house gallery, the, the clinic I showed you before with the, with the amazing ophthalmologist transformation, a food co-op, uh, our own office, a landscape photographer, a jeweller, a milliner, 
woman who makes dance wear, a zine store, a photography gallery. And in the middle of it all, just for, just for an extra layer of interest, we put in free Wi-Fi around the whole precinct as well. So um, that was a practical necessity because a lot of our projects needed internet connections but had no security of tenure. So we were able to provide that as something that they could get without needing to sign up for a long contract. Um, here's a later version of the map. I won't go into all of it, but you, as you can see, we started in this precinct and we've gradually started to move to a whole bunch of sites in other parts of Newcastle and, and expand out and fill a lot more properties. One of the biggest shifts has been a change in perception around Newcastle. So Newcastle has gone from being the place that used to have the steelworks to uh, Lonely Planet uh, 2011 released their list of the top 10 cities in the world to visit this year. Um, the first Australian city ever to make Lonely Planet's top 10 cities list. Suck, Melbourne. Uh, uh, actually, I don't enjoy saying that in Melbourne as much as I enjoy saying that in Sydney. I, I, but um, uh, I quite like Melbourne. But um, the, the, um, only plan uh, the number nine city in the world this year to visit is Newcastle. And the rationale that Lonely Planet used was um, Australia's most underrated city has transformed itself from a steel city to a creative hub, including an explosion of artists, photographers, fashion designers, digital artists and more as part of the inner city regeneration scheme, Renew Newcastle. They, they specifically cited in interviews and, in, and um, in the book itself, Renew Newcastle as the major reason why they had put Newcastle on this list. And, and my favourite my favorite thing ever is reading the comments on the Sydney Morning Herald website when Newcastle was named a top 10 city in the world to visit. That's a whole other story. But um, the benefits I think are pretty obvious. Um, there are more than 70 new projects have started. Some are businesses, some are community projects. We actually don't care. You can be for profit or not for profit. You've got to make what you do and you've got to make the city more interesting by being there. That's pretty much it for us. Um, many new commercial tenants have moved in following the foot traffic. Um, the foot traffic obviously has increased dramatically. There was a story in the TV news in Newcastle of a woman who had closed her business in the city and moved away about three or four years before and moved it back. Um, because in her estimation, the foot traffic had tripled um, and her business was, the business that she had closed down had become viable again and she moved it back. Um, reduced vandalism and maintenance. So um, we, most of these buildings were ones that were getting the windows smashed in, tagged, keyed all the time. We've had three major vandalism incidents across 70 projects in um, two and a half, three years. And one of them was while the building was still empty and someone smashed the window in. Um, compared to the default state, which was that most of these buildings were getting boarded up. A lot of them were getting boarded up or shuttered up because people, the vandalism rates were so high. There's a whole new narrative and media coverage story of Newcastle that's emerged out of this. We've made it distinctive, which I think is really important. One of the, one of the great examples is that one of the people that we work with from GPT actually says he travels all around the country for work and he's got young kids and he likes to get a present for his kids from the places that he goes. And Newcastle's the only place he goes to where he can comfortably get a present that he knows is made there. He goes to Darwin and he gets um, Aboriginal artefacts made in China. You know? um, it's, I thought that was a really telling example. And I think it says a lot about the positioning of old town centres nowadays. I think they have to be places of distinctiveness, not trying to be the commercial shopping centres that they once were. Um, Passive surveillance is improving safety and we're growing long-term value in every sense of the word. You know, co financial, community, social, cultural, whatever that may mean. Few, I'll finish up just with a few observations. One of the things that I think is really critical is the way in which a lot of what we've been able to tap into is the way in which technology is changing the dynamics of cultural production and distribution. So once upon a time, if you were in a place like Newcastle, you had to move to Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane to make your living and do what you do. We tapped into a stack of people who were in Newcastle, were already making, the record label being an example, but a lot of the other projects, they were already selling what they were doing on online markets all around the world. They, they, they had some economies of scale from the global audience, but they had no physical presence in the local community. And we've connected up, I think, to that phenomenon back to the practical problems of the local community in a way that has um, been a catalyst for an interesting transformation. Um, embracing initiative is so important. I'm obsessed with initiative. I'm obsessed with momentum. I'm obsessed with passion. We never talk about them when we talk about whether it's cultural policy or planning policy. The idea that you encourage passionate people to make their passions happen is like, I don't know, it just seems to be a non-factor. But to me, it is the factor. If you, it, it is the most easiest way to achieve the largest number of things with the smallest amount of resources is to help passionate people do what they're passionate about. And that's what we've designed our processes to do from the beginning. Um, be distinctive. We've embraced what can only happen here. 
So we haven't got a bunch of artists from outside to come to Newcastle and do a project and leave. We've, ch we've ch found people in Newcastle to take the stuff that happens in Newcastle and bring it to the fore. And I think that's really, really important in the thinking of what we do. It's not just about the big things, the small things add up. So the big picture transformation, people have long debated in Newcastle about how the big picture transformation, whether it's about building this development or that developer or this massive change or that massive change. Actually, sometimes the big changes come from accumulating all the little things. And I think in some ways we've, we've demonstrated that that works. And sometimes your problems are your opportunities. I, um, I did a version of this talk in Sydney and one of the first questions was from someone from the city of Sydney who said, um, look, that's all well and good, but um, Sydney doesn't have the same advantages that Newcastle has. <laughs> and, and I thought, um, the, the, you know, I, you could capture the success of this project just in that one quote. No one ever complained about the abundance of opportunities in Newcastle before, you know? Um, it's, uh, yeah. So nowadays, we've just started Renew Australia, which I'll finish up on and we'll move into discussion. We're a social enterprise based in Melbourne. Um, based in Brunswick, actually. Um, we do training, project management, consultancy for business and government. Um, we are consciously, as a social enterprise, we're trying to get paid by those kinds of people to then, uh, on the other side, subsidise writing guides, providing open support and training for community groups. Uh, we were, as flagged at the beginning, we, we were uh, a successful project uh, incubated by The Crunch. Uh, the Social Traders Social Enterprise Incubation Scheme, which the Victorian government supported. And we've currently got interest from about 60 locations and uh, quite a few uh, major companies around Australia that are interested in doing things to varying degrees. Um, I'm going to skip that slide and I'm just going to finish on this. We've got a stack of interest from around Victoria. I've been getting... Um, one of the reasons why we created Renew uh, Australia was that Renew Newcastle was getting three to five inquiries a week from places all over the country. I have spoken to or been to people, to Mildura, Frankston, Geelong, Dandenong, um, heard, uh, going to Bairnsdale, um, there's inquiries from Ringwood, it's a whole stack of places around, us, um, around Victoria that are interested in doing these kinds of things. And we are looking for ways to fund and support the development of a pilot scheme and maybe further down the track find ways in which we could roll out some of these initiatives statewide around Victoria. Particularly, I would love to be working on some things that are based somewhere near where I live because um, my family doesn't get to see me very much. So that would be great, if for no other reason than that. Um, so thanks. That's the, that's the Renew Newcastle, Renew Australia story, and then hopefully we can have a bit of a discussion uh, from there about possibilities from here. Yeah. Yeah. So with, in the I left out there's some details. In the interim, I have been doing some work with other communities around the country. So there's renew projects going on in Adelaide, Townsville, a few other places. And, and, and the way that they've worked has tended to be just upfront sort of training and support, um, trying to share the knowledge and then leaving them to their own devices. And I think that's worked some well in some cases and not so well in others. We've identified practical problems that communities face. So things like the legal and accounting and uh, uh, contract insurance issues. So we're hoping to, one of the things we did in Newcastle very early in the piece was identify that if we consolidated all of that in one entity, the cost per project was very low. So, um, so we have a, an umbrella insurance policy, for example, for all of the projects. And we have um, template contracts that um, for 90% of our projects allow us to just spit out the same contract time and time again. So Renew Australia is looking at providing back end those kind of uh, legal accounting contractual stuff to local gr groups that want to run local projects. We are also looking at, and there's examples of where national property owners are talking to us. So um, some of the big property companies nationally wanting to run pilot projects, in which case we would look at employing people directly through Renew Australia. So it's it, um, to run those schemes because they're working on multiple sites. They're not so much defined by geography. So essentially there's a spectrum. We, we can do anything from providing advice to local groups that are doing it themselves. We can provide back-end support around the logistics to local groups that are concentrating on the, just the content side of things and, or the more interesting, the less complex side of things. Or we can fully um, employ and manage people to run schemes in different places as 
out of Renew Australia, well, probably basing them in the local communities, but Renew Australia would be the entity that, that managed that. And we're, we're pretty open to anything in between. Oh, and further along the spectrum, there is already on our website a stack of guides for people who want to do it themselves, right down to legal contracts if people want to go and do that. But um, we, we've, we've found that uh, the more information that people get up front and support they get in understanding the complexities and the decisions that we've made, the better the outcomes tend to be. Um, when you say that uh, there was actually no funding at all for some of those ones that you showed us, yep. um, so you actually provided no money, just contracts and Space. you gave them the keys to the derelict site and they did the rest? Yep. Wow. Yep. Um, there's, there's might have been, uh, there may have been some exceptions to that. There's a, there's a couple of examples, I think, where we had to spend a little bit of money as part of our agreement with the owner on like painting the front of the building or putting the glass back in or whatever. But fundamentally what you see in the transformation of those places are the work of the passionate people who wanted to use those places. It's not, it's not, it's not a funding program. You know, we've never had any money to give out. And most, mostly what people are doing, and this is part of the thinking came from the other end, a lot of what we're doing is supporting the sort of people who actually aren't well suited to funding programs. You know, these aren't the sort of people who are going to apply for an Arts Victoria grant. Um, the timelines don't make sense. They don't quite fit the boxes. Often what they're doing isn't capital A art enough. It falls between the cracks a bit. And so we're deliberately, one of the questions that fed into this is how do you support those kinds of people, which is a, which is a separate question, but um, has merged with this process and led to what we're doing. You haven't talked about um, the role that local government might have played. Were mm. they critical and if so, in what ways? A few people have said to me, oh, we love this idea, but we couldn't do it because we've got this terrible, crusty council where yeah. we are. What, what's your view about that? Yeah. Well, we, um, we had almost no relationship with the council. One of the key things that we decided to do... I went to... Cal in, 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 there's, there's a spectrum here. So I went to Newcastle Council initially and tried to pitch the idea that they should do this. And for lots of reasons, some of which are quite practical and some of which were just frustrating, they, they never could get their heads around doing it or work out how to do it. The, in the end, we, we decided to focus our processes on all the things you don't need permission for, which meant we didn't actually have to... For example, we've done 70-something projects, we've had to do one development application um, because we match every single project to an approved pre-existing use that, that prevents that. We deliberately... We do fast turnaround, we do all of that sort of stuff. There is a whole area of work now. We get funding from local, we get funding from the council now. We're up and running. And we have worked, started to work with other councils around the country as Renew Australia or me as an individual. So the projects that have come in Townsville, there's a project in the Gold Coast and a few others, um, have come from the initiative of local councils. Um, there are lots that local councils can do for, to facilitate this sort of thing, which are around incentives and processes a lot of the time, as well as directly funding these kinds of initiatives. But for a lot of reasons to do with process mainly, councils are often not the best groups to run these kind of schemes. Um, and my advice to get local councils where I've been speaking to them has been, you should be once removed, maybe represented on, maybe funding, have a, have a relationship with, but um, be once removed from the entity that runs these kinds of schemes. Because often, the, the most practical example is that if you're getting a building on a rolling 30-day day process, uh, 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 rolling 30 days from today, if you've got a process that takes more than 30 days to decide who can use it, you can't use it. Um, and most councils don't have processes that can make a decision today. You know, that's, that's, they're very hard to do that. So we've, been, we've designed a lot of our stuff around that. But one of the things that I'm really interested in, sort of on the slide I, I skipped, but is working with a range of councils to develop best practice approaches to how councils can facilitate this, how they can streamline processes, how they can um, provide incentives. You know, in, in some cases, you've got councils providing incentives for people to leave properties empty. You've got councils sitting on empty properties for a long period of time. Um, there are, councils are, can, in some cases, or the various levels of government, in some cases, are the worst offenders for leaving buildings empty for long periods of time. I would love to establish processes and precedents where Renew Australia can activate those spaces in the, in the interim as well. Other questions? Yeah. Jenny. Jenny Doran, did you have any, tell us about your, you know, difficult circumstances. Did you have to say no to very many people or did you have some, any difficult tenants? Yeah. We've had to say no to more than we've said yes to. Um, so we've done 70 projects. We've had about 450, 500 proposals, something in that range now. So um, it's a relatively small proportion of projects that get up. Sometimes there's a lot of reasons. So sometimes 
you're filtering out things that frankly just don't fit the guidelines and don't make any sense. There are others, I, I often find myself saying some of the best project ideas we got were things we've never done because of the complexity of doing them. So anything involving, most things involving performance, for example, require a really high bar in terms of approvals and building code and whatever that we're mostly unable to meet. Uh, projects involving uh, just anything that requires a long lead time or certainty sort of filters itself out. Um, but you know, that then naturally kind of reduces our projects down to probably a third of the applicants that are actually suitable. And then it's a case of horses for courses. In any given building, we are trying to match the best use we can get happening as soon as possible, not holding out for an ideal use or trying to fit something into a building it doesn't fit. So that's been quite integral to the thinking. So that's meant in some cases we say no. More often we say we don't have an opportunity for you right now and if you stay for the good ones, if you stay with us, we'll keep looking. And over time, we do start to slot some of those into opportunities. We've had some difficult tenants, but we have found that it hasn't been a major issue. I think people tend to be much more um, paranoid about the worst case scenario. We've got contingencies for the worst case scenarios, but in practice, we've actually, you know, perversely, one of our biggest successes is that we've moved 20 or 30 projects out when people wanted the buildings back. And there's never been, there's never been so much as a you know, a hint of a bad story in the local press about that. There's never been a, there's never been a, an, a had to, you know, we never had to give anyone a legal notice. We've never had to do any of that. However, our processes are designed so that we've got all of those contingencies covered should we ever have to do that. More often than not, projects, when things have to move out or projects fall apart, it's, it's their own internal reasons that they're falling apart and often it's just a case of us helping them extricate themselves as they realise it isn't working. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful demonstration of, um, sort of serial leveraging mm. success upon success. I'm just wondering if there's a kind of inherent paradox insofar as the, uh, the return of commercial longer term tendency yeah. reduces the options for the initiatives. Yeah, there is. Um, but I don't mind a paradox. Um, I think uh, there's a few things there. I mean, one of the things is that you know, there's, a, there's often reduced to a sort of narrative about gentrification, but one of, the, one of the, the standard kind of narrative about gentrification is that artists are organically attracted to an area because it's cheap and easy to do things there and then they get moved out. The problem that we had in Newcastle was that the prerequisite wasn't that. It didn't start off as being easy for people to do stuff here. It actually started off hard. And if it reverts, for them to, reverts to it being hard again, um, the zero sum, it's, you know, you haven't lost anything. You've started a lot of things. One of the things that happens with our commercial, the, the commercial tenants is that some of them are our projects. Our projects are growing into being successful, viable commercial tenants, which is, which is success in itself. Also, projects morph and take on other forms. I, I don't tend to, like most arts projects have a limited life. Most small businesses have a limited life. Most, most things are not going to be there forever. And I'm actually okay with the idea that you start a lot of things and see, see what sticks, rather than the idea that you start a few things or you wait forever because you don't start anything because you're worried about what might happen. You know? So um, I think the organic process actually works pretty well. The qu key question for me though is not about that area. So it's not about whether the mall where we started has commercial shops in it or not. The key question is the one I started with in the first place, which no one's even asking. How easy is it for people without capital to start things. And, you, and I, I, am con I would be concerned if we created a dynamic that made it impossible for people without capital to start things. We've created a da dynamic that makes that possible. And over time, it limits the opportunities in some of the spaces where we're working. But we're constantly creating new opportunities for people without capital to start things. And I think um, the, 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 that's the key test for me of whether a city, it's not whether it's got funky bars or whether it's, you know, like a, it's an artist hangout or whatever. The, the test for me of whether a city or a place is achieving what is important to me is whether someone who has limited resources can start something. And I keep going back to that test. And I think we, for the time being, that test is still much stronger in Newcastle because we're there than it, than it would have been otherwise. Oh, look, I was actually going to ask something very similar about, about that paradox, but I'll, I'll revert to something else that was on my mind, which was, mm. How on earth did you encourage the people that owned the buildings to get on board? Yeah. That must have been incredibly difficult. You know, it's supposed to be, but it wasn't. Um, I mean, it was. Look, 
the first thing that was, this is, this is very systematic. So we, we, we started by thinking about all of the reasons why they would say no and designing processes that intersected all of the reasons why they might say no. So we, didn't go, we have not gone to owners with any kind of um, requests for their benevolence. We've gone to them with what we think is a very practical proposal based on the circumstances that they're in. We had good lawyers, we had the right kinds of contracts, we thought through the framework and we applied all of that thinking before we ever went and talked to a property owner. The biggest single reason why a property owner will not make a property available is opportunity cost. It's, it's that they think that if they let you in there, they'll have to give up something else. Like someone might come along and rent that property. I might not be able to get you out, you know? Um, and those, once you've addressed those key issues, it actually gets much easier. So our rolling 30-day agreement is designed around the idea that there's no opportunity cost. At any moment, um, the owner, if they get a better offer, they can take it. And we, as Renew Newcastle, as an independent organisation that has stakes our reputation and our ability to do this, can get the projects out when that happens. And that is 90% of the battle. The, the rest of the battle is finding the owners. It's actually sitting down, finding the person to talk to and sitting down across a, a table and actually having that discussion. We've found when we can actually talk to a decision maker, we probably get about a 90% success rate. The hard part is, and the reason there's still a lot of buildings empty in Newcastle, is that there, there is no decision maker or we can't find them. So um, once we've addressed the practical things, it gets a bit easier. There's also a lot, I could talk for hours about tax and legal and accounting consequences. One of, the, one of the bizarre things that I've discovered through this is that it is much easier to get an owner to give you an empty building for free if you don't want to lock it up than it is for you to lease it for a sub market value or sub or below the nominal value that they've given it, because often they have tax, accounting, and um, valuation consequences tied up in the value, the commercial value of the property. The fact that we don't lease them and we don't make a claim on them, we simply license the right to access them, means that we don't trigger a lot of the complexities that are the reasons why they leave buildings empty. I've talked for hours about that, but it's a whole other thing. But fundamentally, it was about thinking from the owner's perspective and dotting the I's and crossing the T's before we talk to them. Yes. All of our projects are licenses. And, but some of those licenses involve a fee. You said there were some lawyers? Uh, yeah, well, so we don't pay the owners for you. As a, as a starting principle, we do not pay for the use of the buildings. We don't, we don't pay any rent. So we borrow them basically from their owners while they're empty. The projects pay a $20 participation fee a week to renew Newcastle, which goes into a kitty that covers insurance and minor maintenance on the, on the properties. We spend more than that on the properties. So it's, we're very clear to the owners that we're not, making it, we're not skimming money off here. Um, and then we have agreed, the key, the key expectation is that the owners, the projects pay the outgoings. So any costs incurred by them being there are paid by them. Power, water, utilities, all that sort of stuff. In some cases, owners have said to us, look, we've, you know, that's all well and good, but I've got body corporate fees or I've got a cleaner fee or I've got some other external fee that is, the owner is paying, which is essentially a service that is for the building. And we have found projects that have agreed to pay those costs, which sometimes go above the $20 a week. You know, we've had examples of up to $80 a week or, or more, which are, but they're actual identified costs that the owner is paying out of their pocket. And we just pick those up while we're in there. The projects pick those up. Yeah. The, the projects pay the cost of themselves being there, is the principle. And we guarantee that. So in the end, the owner's never going to have to chase the project for the missing power bill. We'll pay the power bill if the project flakes off, you know. Any final question? Yeah. Have you been able to tackle larger retail spaces? A lot of those retail spaces are relatively single owner shops. Yeah. Department stores of that scale is a bit tricky. Um, some of our projects have gone into, there's a whole other aspect to this which is all about finding the right projects for the right spaces. Some of our projects have used large spaces, so for things like, um, you know, a small single fronted shop is great for a craftsperson that's making all their own work and selling it there. Um, a big cavernous open space, so we've had large fashion retailers, like, you know, places like a uh, like Lowe's or, you know, like a, you know, a you know, triple fronted deep, you know, shop that, it, that, that was big. Um, that's useful for things like the photography gallery, you know, or contemporary art space, people who've got 
you know, works that you want to stand back and look at and, and you can see from the other side of the, the hall or the room or whatever. So um, we tend to tackle horses for courses. When you get onto buildings that are multi-storey and the spaces aren't really divided very well, where the cost involved in dividing them are very high, we are interested to do those kinds of projects. There's one example, there's a David Jones in the precinct that has closed down that we would be interested to use. But the owner in that case has said, look, it's just too much trouble because of the way the space is configured and the, the, the way you need to have people supervising the multiple exits that you need to use, the um, fact that the air you need to require to put the air conditioning on and it's got an air conditioned three storeys and you might only be using one of them. I, I'm very interested to find projects where we can tackle those issues because I think we need to find solutions to them and I think we can, but you need to have a willing owner who's willing to engage and invest in the time required to, to, um, to think that through. The, the practical thing is that the rolling 30 day thing means that you, the inherent thing is you've got to find ways of using space that don't involve spending a lot of capital. The moment you say you can use it but it's going to cost $10,000 to move the exit doors or refit the fire escape or do that whatever, we're out of play. We have to be able to find ways and a lot of my interest is in you know, changing approaches to compliance around some of these things as well but we have to be able to find ways that people with limited capital but sometimes great human resources and volunteers and whatever can make space work. Marcus hasn't told you about his other startup strategy, which was lying to Central Bank to get this through. Oh, that was that was a different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Important strategy um, in getting a startup. Yeah. Uh, we've come to the end of the time that we formally have with Marcus. Uh, as you can see, lots of light bulbs have gone on for us in GPCD, but also right around Victoria, as various communities are kind of grappling with whether. Um, there's a way that these sorts of ideas could be applied to the particular challenges they've got in finding uh, cheap and free places to do cultural things well and marrying all those things. So it's a pretty exciting time for us to be grappling with this. In GPCD and the community development team, Erica Sanders and Tony Morton are really keen to be um, connecting with those of you who are interested in this topic and how it is that we might kind of um, work a bit more cleverly to, on, on ways to sort of embed this idea as other communities put up their hands and talk to Renew Australia about these, these opportunities. So um, watch this space because we'll be um, talking a lot more with Marcus into the future about the potential. Would you show your appreciation for what he's doing today? <laughs>